Uh, David, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm a longstanding, I think you could probably say fanatic of Dr. Bronner's, mainly because of the product. That's what got me into the brand. But what I love most about Dr. Bronner's are the ethics and advocacy of the brand. And I also have so much respect and admiration for the way the company is run, which we'll dive into during this conversation. But first, can you share the story of how Dr. Bronner's soap and the iconic label came to be? Yeah, so um, so my granddad was a third generation German Jewish soap maker, a master soap maker. Um, his grandfather first started manufacturing soap in Laupheim, a small southern German town in the Jewish quarter in 1858. And um, my granddad, he came, uh, so he, he was born in 1929, he was 21, he was working for my, uh, for my grand, great granddad and his two uncles. So his father and two uncles, and they had grown the family enterprise to be one of the largest soap makers in Germany. Um, and yeah, so my granddad was very Zionist. He, um, you know, it was pretty ardent that, you know, that Jews would not be safe without their own homeland and, um, and activists in other ways and, and was clashing with his dad and two uncles who were like not interested in him mixing his politics with soap making and, you know, just kind of keep it down and, um, and was just, um, yeah, just in a lot of conflict, I think, with his dad and wanted to forge his own path. So he came over in 29 to America. Um, and set up shop in Chicago. So he was a consultant to the US soap industry, um, helped launch products and build factories for P&G and you know, various soap manufacturers of, of the day. And um, I met uh, my grandmother, Paula in Milwaukee and, and actually had a, uh, three children in the thirties. Um, um, and uh, so my dad, Jim being the youngest and my uncle Ralph and Aunt Helen. Um, and just in this time was also getting increasingly desperate to get his family out and his two sisters got out. So, uh, so my Tata Lottie in 36 got out and ended up in a kibbutz uh, and then Palestine, they and Gev kibbutz, kibbutz, now Israel. Um, my great aunt uh, Louisa got out in 38 right before they closed the borders. But my uh, my great grandparents, like a lot of bourgeois Jews thought they were gonna ride out the madness and stayed till it was too late. So the, the factory was Aaronized in 1940 and they were deported and killed shortly after. And my granddad's response, and then also in this time, Paula, my grandmother got sick and was in and out of hospitals and, and she died when my dad was like three. And wow. um, so he was just going through immense tragedy. And somehow his response to this was that, um, was you know this mystical insight that all the faith traditions of the world were all pointing to the same transcendent source we're all children of the same you know that same love and, and and light at the heart of existence somehow in the midst of all the suffering and absurdity and when we're not demonizing each other and making idols out of their beliefs and uh and and are open um and and, and realize our transcendent unity across ethnic and religious divides, then this is what he called the all one God faith. Like this was pretty much our only shot of surviving in a nuclear armed world. So he felt urgently called to spread his message of peace and love across ethnic and religious divides. He's going around the country lecturing um, and selling his family's Castile soap recipes. So the, the famous liquid soap, which was out of fashion at the time. So in the post-World War II era, most industries were moving to a petrochemical basis. So there's advent of fertilizers and pesticides and plastics. And he early on saw the problem of doing this and that the you know, like ecological harm that was gonna attend that. So he stayed true to these natural Castile soap re recipes were very biodegradable and basically making soap in the same way it's been made for millennia. Although uh, we do it in a way that's uh, you know much uh, faster and, and, and we optimize a lot of the conditions, but basically it's, it's as simple as baking bread. And, and, and as natural. And, um, and so as he was going around the country lecturing on his peace plan, word got out that, wow, this is pretty gosh darn good soap. And people were coming just to get the soap and weren't really sticking around to hear what he had to say. So that's when he downloaded his message on the bottle. 
And so that message is basically a one love message. And he's trying to show how all the spiritual giants across faith traditions, so Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, uh, you know, they're all on the same wavelength and, and, and talking about, you know, the one love and getting down with each other and being kind. And, and uh, so that, that's basically what the label's about, um, although it's got an overall kind of Judaic. Uh, he, he always considered himself an Essene rabbi, um, but it's very much a universalist message and um yeah he just uh, dedicated his life and uh he, he the company wasn't even a for-profit company it was a non-profit religious organization and the soap was there to sell the label more than the label was there to sell the soap and um yeah and then with the uh, with the advent of the counterculture in the 60s and, and a generation that you know woke up to the harm of our you know western industry on the planet and is there of silent spring and all the songbirds are, are being killed because of the huge overdosing of, of agriculture with pesticides and synthetic fertilizers and just the you know the burgeoning of the environmental movement and and you know in a, in a war machine that wouldn't stop and this generation that dropped out and wanted to you know lead simpler alternative lifestyles you know more in harmony with the earth um, you know, here's this soap that you can wash your dog dishes and, uh, you know, hair by the side of the river and not worry about it and had this groovy message of peace. So that's, so the soaps really became an iconic part of the counterculture. And, and then from there spread into pretty much all the health food stores of the day and kind of came forward into the nineties with the health food movement. And then as the health food, you know, health and wellness went mainstream, then, then our soaps really, um, you know, now they're pretty much everywhere. Um, I will say that the IRS disagreed with my granddad's tax exempt self designation and, uh, and my granddad lost and um, we were in bankruptcy and reorganized and that's when my dad and uh, mom, my dad Jim, my mom Trudy and Uncle Ralph stepped in and righted the ship and I, uh, my dad I grew up working on, in his totally separate business. Um, he had a chemical consulting business he developed firefighting foam for structure and forest fires and then made a version for our, for Hollywood, for movies and commercial sets, like a, like a foam that looked like snow that we blast on trees and stuff. But, um, but he, so when my granddad got sick and then he's in this big battle with the IRS. So he, he came in and fired all the bad advisors and, you know, got the company on a sound financial footing and exited at bankruptcy as a for-profit, but we continue to honor that nonprofit DNA. Um, and, and so, yeah, we're, basically a hybrid social venture that caps our executive salaries and gives all the profits to the different causes and charities we believe in and very much, you know, hold true to that model that, um, uh, that our granddad had that, you know, business is an engine for social and environmental change. And, um, you know, if we're not, if, if everybody's not prospering, then nobody's prospering. And mm -hmm. so that's where we're, you know, we just, uh, yeah, try to try to honor his vision. What an incredible story. I mean, the terrible experiences from your grandfather, um, losing his parents and the Holocaust, uh, to turning around to a message of all for one or all for none. Mm -hmm. right? Needing to unite together if we're going to survive um, and continue and finding ways to get that message out there through what he knew best, which was soap making. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And, um, you know, and it was pretty brilliant too, because like you forget your magazine and go into the bathroom and, and then he's got you. <laughs> so, <laughs> On the yeah. label. Absolutely. Um, now the the brand has something called the six cosmic principles um which are a good introduction to the values can you explain what they are and how they influence the company culture yeah so um uh so the six cosmic principles and you'll probably have to remind me of one or two of them but basically it's you know do right by customers do right by our suppliers uh, do right by our workers do right by the earth um, you know, and fund and fight for what's right, like use our profits to, uh, um, you know, drive progressive policy, you know, just making, um, you know, just grappling with the major social and environmental crises of our time and doing our part to help um, power up allies that are working hard to, you know, make things better. 
and I, mi I missed one. I forget one, which one it was. I don't know, don't but I think, it. yeah, it's, I think those are incredible. And the way that the company actually does stand by each of them. Um, so looking at all stakeholders along yeah. the process, whether they're consumers or people involved in the supply chain, um, or employees. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just looked it up and it, it's work hard grow, which is, a, a, you know, it's funny. That's the one I forgot, but that's the financial, you know, we have to actually run a tight ship here that, you know, makes soap in, you know, the right way every time that people will super dig and generate the profits that make everything else possible. And one of the things you mentioned that I'd like to circle back to is that Dr. Bronner's established an executive pay cap. Can you tell us about why you decided to put that in place? Yeah, I mean, early on when I came in, so my granddad died in 97 and, and my dad and mom and uncle had been running the ship for through the 90s. And um, uh, actually my granddad was, was uh, died on the same day my daughter Maya was born, March 7th, 1997. Um, and it was right around then that I made the decision to come back in the company. It was somewhat of a circuitous route, um, but finally kind of understood what my granddad was all about and wanted to de dedicate my life to his vision. And um, and fortunately had made that decision then because a month later, my dad was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and given six months. And yeah. so I was able to come back into the family company, not because I had to, but because I chose to and um, spend an incredible year with my dad. And he lived to see, to see his daughter, my sister, Mary, my brother-in-law, Michael, Michael Milam, who's now our chief of operations um, in, in June 6th, and he died on June 12th of 1998. So I had to step up pretty young. I was like 24 and, um, you know, and, you know, with my mom and my uncle and, and, and Ron Bronner's and, um, but this was, you know, at the same time, this is a time of when, with the first major integration of health and wellness. So like the rise of Whole Foods and like the supernatural stores and, and you know, ma mainstream markets still weren't stocking natural so much, but things were starting to, to, to go. And, and I could see, you know, what kind of trajectory we were on and also could see in our personal lives how uh, expenditures rise to meet income, you know, you just gotta get the next more awesome house and car and whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I was like, okay, well, what, what's a reasonable cap where we can like fully enjoy our lives and whatever, you know, we make within that, you know, do whatever you want, but everything above that, that is for the world. That's for like people doing awesome stuff and, and, and political campaigns, making better policies for everybody. And so we came up with, with the five to one cap so that, you know, all profits that we don't need for the company um, are given to charity and causes no matter how big we get. And so back then we were, you know, $5 million company. And last year with COVID, we hit 200 million. We we're able to give away 15 million. Um, but, you know, it's clear that no matter how profitable we get, we'll, you know, none of us are personally profiting from that. Um, you know, and we really, um, uh, really appreciate steward ownership models. We're not yet there. We're still a closely held family company. But there's, you know, in principle agreement to move to some kind of, you know, perpetual steward ownership where we don't have individual shareholders. That's going to take a while because we got some trust and it's complex to, to do that. It's better given the model that we have to figure out how to um, put it in some kind of self-perpetuating nonprofit structure. Um, uh, and then still maintain family control. And, and there's, you know, there's, it's a complex calculus, but we're, we're working on it. That's really cool that you're already thinking long-term about that, the implications of the company as leadership changes um, and who within the family is involved changes, et cetera. Um, now, shifting topic a little bit, in an article, you talked about um, the awareness that organic didn't go far enough when it comes to an agricultural sourcing standpoint, since that certification doesn't communicate the whole picture of what's important to both society and the planet. 
And in 2005, you put forth the idea of creating an ethical and sustainable supply chain that went much further than organic. So ensuring that workers had a livable wage and raw materials are acquired in a responsible way. How did you start that journey? Can you share a bit about that? Yeah, so um, so my granddad, you know, as I, as I noted, he stayed true to natural casil soaps you know, didn't kind of succumb to the temptation to do these newfangled detergent based products and most quote unquote liquid soaps on the shelf today have no soap in them. They're actually 100% synthetic detergent and the FDA just doesn't even regulate the term soap uh, when it comes to liquid soap and it does a kind of half ass job with with bar soap. Um, and, and that's awesome. But with the Rise Organic as a program and, uh, you know, just really starting to think about, oh, okay, like, you know, our raw materials or agriculture and origin, you know, well, there's not like a whole lot of pesticide and synthetic fertility on the tree crops we use. There's, there's definitely some, you know, pretty damaging pro uh, projects or, 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 or agricultural methods. And, and then even worse, um, you know, when you think about like palm in particular, um, you know, there's palm plantations in Indonesia and Borneo that, that are, uh, you know, they're ripping up huge amounts of rainforest and orangutan habitat and wetlands and huge amounts of carbon is being oxidized in the atmosphere. And so, so I guess I wasn't thinking about all that then, but it was just like mostly in terms of like, well, we don't want anyone getting saturated in pesticides and contaminating ecosystems. And, you know, that's the problem with the, with the pesticide intensive agriculture is you're, you know, you're not only killing what's on your farm, it's like it gets in the water and then you just, you know, it starts killing all kinds of non-target wildlife. And, um, so that was the initial impetus, but we were still buying from brokers and, you know, didn't really have any real visibility into the actual farming communities and growing conditions where the coconuts and the palm and all of them being grown. And, you know, what were the conditions in the factory that was converting them into the oil? And we realized that organic, um, like one, it doesn't have any social fairness. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing about fair prices or wages or working conditions in the organic program. And then second of all, that as far as organic, um, it's more kind of what you shouldn't do. Like you shouldn't spay, uh, use pesticides and you shouldn't use synthetic fertility, but it's not really saying what you should do. Hmm. you know, which is regenerative organic agriculture, like actually building soil fertility within your farm using like biodynamic regenerative techniques. And like, there's a lot of organic farmers and growers who are like, so they're either organic by neglect or they're doing what's like kind of like input substitution. They're using like CAFO, a like confined animal f factory operations. So these um, are farming operations, but otherwise known as factory farms, taking like, uh, you know, basically manure, animal manure, and just kind of replacing synthetic nitrogen, but not really doing anything to actually build soil fertility on their farm. And, and there's different regenerative practices of like understanding what kind of cover crops that are nitrogen fixing that'll naturally bring nitrogen from the atmosphere into your soil. Um, you know, understanding intercropping, like what kind of crops do well together and, and what kind of rotation and um, you know, perimeter planning for, for uh, pollinators and predatory insects that like control pests naturally. And there's all kinds of things you should be doing and not just like, yeah, there, there's all, there's different ways to do organic. And we wanted to incentivize like true regenerative organic practices. And we wanted to make sure that the farmers uh, were getting a fair price that they in turn could pay their workers fairly and take care of their land in the right way. So yeah, so so first we were certified organic in 2003, but in 2005 we began in earnest to also certify fair trade and to look for projects that were both organic and fair trade, so that would be both environmentally and socially sustainable. And that's, that's a long story I can go into, but yeah. Well, I think tied to, to that journey, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you're a board member of something called Regenerative Organic Certified, who's, I think it's their tagline on their website. It says, farm like the world depends on it, which I think yeah. is brilliant because it's true. 
um, Regenerative Organic Alliance or ROA was established in 2017 by a group of farmers, business leaders, experts in soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness. And the website says ROA exists to heal a broken system, repair a damaged planet and empower farmers and eaters to create a better future through regenerative organic farming. Can you share a bit about, I guess, how ROA came to be and what you hope for its future? Yeah. So, so I, I guess I'll begin with our own project. So, so our first project was in Sri Lanka after the tsunami hit in 2004. And one of our aces, Gero Lasson, uh, he was a consultant at the time, but we'd connected over hemp. He was, um, had been working on hemp fiber as an alternative to synthetic um, petroleum fibers and um, but had uh, extensive coconut fiber networks in Sri Lanka. And we were supporting a, a disaster relief organization, like a microloan thing that he had, he called it Second Aid, um, where you gave like loans to like sewing shops and, and fishing boat owners to like repair their boats and fishing shops and kind of get the industry restarted. And, and I, told, I was like, yeah, you know, we're looking to go fair trade and there's all these coconut, you know, so Sri Lanka is like famous for coconut oil and you've got all these, you know, contacts and networks. Let's look at like, you know, building a, a you know, a fair trade organic coconut su um, supply chain there. And, you know, it took a long time, but uh, Serenipol was born a few years later um, and uh, 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 Gordon and Sonali is a, a father-daughter team. There are local partners there, um, just amazing. And, you know, work with Garo and, and other ACEs on our team to uh, create this, this wonderful um, company. Uh, we bought a, an oil, old coconut oil processing mill, like really made it uh, state-of-the-art and partnered with over a thousand farmers on regenerative organic, fair trade terms, um, you know, built a huge compost facility to help them built for fertility naturally, promoted, you know, best regenerative practices and, um, and yeah, and actually launched a, a virgin coconut oil, culinary oil, in addition to supplying our soaps. Um, that was really, really popular. It's less so now and coconut oil went through a huge, we hit it right at the right time. We had no idea, but coconut oil went through this massive, you know, spike, but, um, uh, and then also Palm, uh, that was, that's a big one. And in 2008, we launched Serenda Palm in Ghana. And similarly, it's a uh, oil processing, uh, you know, all, all the workers are paid fairly and it's all awesome. And we work with like 800 farmers there um, who are growing Palm in a regenerative organic way. And Ghana is the, uh, or, or East Africa is the, the birthplace of Palm. And we're showing that there's nothing inherent about palm that's evil. It's just another crop. And every crop can be grown in a regenerative or degenerative way. Um, and our farmers there are actually practicing something called dynamic ag forestry or multi-strata forest, ag forestry. And this is where if you look at a wild ecosystem, like a wild forest, you'll have tall trees, mid-level trees, bushes, and ground cover. And that is maximizing the photosynthetic capture and biomass yield relative to a monoculture, which is not. And um, in addition to monoculture, you have huge pests and weed problems, well, especially pests and insect, insect problems, because you have this like this one plant that the whatever pest that specializes on it is just, you know, this is all right there. Um, so when you actually break that up in a dynamic planning and understand like okay, like, all right, we'll have pa tall palm trees, we're gonna have mid-level cocoa and banana, and then we'll have casaba on the ground. And you understand how the canopies fill in and you get the right, you know, planting distances that when you do this right, and it's knowledge intensive agriculture, not chemical intensive agriculture. When you do this right, you're minimizing weed and pest pressure. You're, you're, you're doubling the yields and the, and the incomes. Huge amounts of biomass is going into the soil, um, you're putting huge amounts of carbon into the soil. And, um, and so that's that when we got, really got passionate about the potential for regenerative agriculture for, well, you know, there's so many good reasons for it. It's, you know, boosting farmer incomes and in rural economies. Um, it's making farms more drought resilient. The, um, that carbon, putting carbon in the soil through all that biomass. Um, and, just the, you're, and you're just feeding the soil and like a good organic farmer is feeding the soil. And when you feed the soil, it's like alive. It's a, it's a, a very complex ecosystem. 
and the just natural photosynthetic. Um, uh, so, so the process of photosynthesis that brings carbon dioxide and turns it into carbo carbohydrates that makes the root shoots and leaves of a, of a plant, 20 to 40 percent of those carbohydrates are exudated into the soil to feed the microbiota and the mycorrhizal fungi and, and that are in um, symbiotic relationship with all plants. And in I, unfortunately, in industrial agriculture, that's pretty much destroyed. That whole microbiota is just gone because there's so many chemicals being put on it. And we're bringing our crops to harvest with more and more chemicals. And, you know, it's, you know, genetically engineered to withstand huge amounts of weed killer and it's totally unhealthy. And the soil's dead, all the carbon and life in it's been oxidized the atmosphere. It's a huge contributor to greenhouse gas. So regenerative organic agriculture, when you're doing this right, it's like, you're like rebuilding, how do you say, re restoring a forest. So like when you clear cut a forest and then you, re you know, plant a tree and how, how good that is for the climate and stuff. Well, when you farm regeneratively, what you're doing to the soils, it's almost like reforesting a clear cut forest. You're bringing that soil back to life and all the carbon, you know, comes, you know, the, the natural soil forming processes kick in and all the, all the you know, carbon that's in the, in the life itself, but then also, humus is formed in this process and humus is is uh you know it's really rich organic rich long-term recalcitrant carbon so it's actually soil is actually one of the largest carbon sinks for atmospheric carbon that we have mm. so rather than like engineering like carbon capture technology we can just take one third of their service that's right now under industrial agricultural mismanagement and such a huge problem for the climate and everything and, and, and the ecosystems and the sixth great extinction we're, we're living through but if you farm in nature's image and you do these regenerative organic techniques and set up a bunch of chemicals you're doing knowledge intensive agriculture you're replicating natural ecosystem you're 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 also regenerating that soil and putting huge amounts of carbon so at global scale this could be one of the, our major strategies to mitigate climate change and also when you put all that carbon it, it's the the water storage capacity of the soil is is magnified greatly like something like each one percent increment of carbon in soil is like forty thousand gallons it can hold so when you go from you know one percent to six percent i mean it's just a huge amount and so it makes it much more drought resistant um you can handle huge rain events like rain, you know instead of like washing all your crappy soil that you barely have away it can handle it's like you know just really can handle a big rain event and store that water and, um so yeah there's so many benefits to, to this method of agriculture um and another uh, our olive oil comes from 90 percent from palestinian farmers in the west bank um and the balance from uh, a jewish family farm and a Christian Palestinian project on the Israeli side, um, and symbolize you know we got Muslim, Christian, Jewish olive oil on our soaps, symbolizing my granite's vision. It's all regenerative organic, and um, so yeah, so we got religion about regenerative organic agriculture, and um, partnered with Patagonia, the big clothing company, and Rodale Institute, which is like the godfather of um, of the organic movement in the U.S. Demeter for a little bit. Um, they, they hold a biodynamic standard, um, which is awesome, really, really amazing. Um, and Compassion World Farming, which is an amazing uh, animal welfare organization, and um, uh, Fair World Project, which does a lot of advocacy around fair labor and uh, uh, farm worker labor issues. And, uh, and then other really cool brands and, and uh, farms and ranchers. And, um, and yeah, built a standard. And the idea is that, you know, organics like, okay, but um, it doesn't go far enough. And mm -hmm. we need to actually build like, you know, kind of more what you should be doing into the standard. Like, you know, it's not enough to just not use chemicals. You need to be doing X, Y, Z to boost your farm fertility. And, and then if you're raising animals, like even organic program, it's pretty weak um, on, on animal welfare criteria. So we, we enshrine pasture-based criteria so like the animal welfare approved and certified humane pasture level and um, global animal partnership four and above so these are the different kind of high bar animal welfare certifications out there they're all correspond to pasture like no confined systems mm -hmm. um and then on the fair labor side um yeah we have a whole you know we have three pillars soil health animal welfare and, and fair labor so that you know that 
uh, workers are paying paid, paid fairly and the working conditions are fair and you're not working, you know, 80 hour weeks and you're getting your breaks and, and you're getting, you know, enough money. And so it's basically kind of bringing together the best of the soil health, animal welfare and fair labor movements into a single standard. And um, yeah, so that you don't have to look for a bunch of different, you know, symbols and seals. And um, we just launched last year, it took a while, we got through our pilot phase and um you know in the time of covid it's been pretty tricky uh you know getting farmers certified and, and all that but there's huge amount of interest and a lot of products are in the pipeline and brands and farms and ranches so it's pretty exciting there is so much that i love about what you just said and i want to pull out a few pieces one a thing that just popped to my head as you were talking about the certification is it's kind of like an all one for a certification. And I'm looking at your hat, which says all one in it, and that being like a mainstay of Dr. Bronner's and, and within the um, regenerative organic, it is pulling the best of all of those different worlds and putting it into one place, which, which is pretty incredible. I also just really appreciated your explanation of regenerative farming. I didn't really understand it. I kind of understood the idea as a concept before, but your explanation as far as farming in nature's image and mm. really creating a why it's harmful to just have one crop because you basically get rid of the entire ecosystem. You know, mm. our, our world is an ecosystem and instead you're doing it intelligently where you're thinking about the different layers of canopies and the different layers of animals that naturally do the things you need to have happen and letting letting nature do its thing, creating the environment where that ecosystem actually exists the way it's supposed to exist and all of the benefits that come from that. So that was a really amazing explanation. Thank you for that. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I'm a vegan since 96. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I do appreciate that there is such a thing as a, a sustainable balance of animal and plant life in a wild ecosystem, and there can be in a, for, in a, in a farming ecosystem, but the number of animals right now that we're farming or, or raising and slaughtering is, I mean, it's, a, it's an ethical and humane and environmental disaster and social because it's just the, the super dangerous working conditions for everybody involved. And, um, but we need to get the animals out of their cages and integrated back onto the land, especially ruminants. And, you know, cows are not evolved to eat corn and feedlots. I mean, they, they want to eat grass. And, and so we, and, and, and in numbers that make sense for the, for the land and aren't going to like make it worse by overgrazing it. But when you integrate animals in a, in a smart way, it can be actually a, a, a regenerative, you know, an overall regenerative system, just like a natural ecosystem can be. Um, you know, I'm going to be vegan until the day I die, but we're, we're in solidarity with the high animal welfare, grass-fed beef, uh, you know, grass, uh, uh, you know, in the pasture operations that, um, you know, I think we need to unite against the factory farming machine that's eating us for lunch and the, and the earth for lunch. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Another thing I wanted to mention, um, so Dr. Garrow, do you say his last name, Lesson? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for mentioning that because I um, should have remembered. Yeah. <laughs> he's Garrow the Lisson. yeah. Garrow Lisson. He's the vice president of special operations for Dr. Bronner's, and he recently wrote a book called Honor Thy Label, Dr. Bronner's Unconventional Journey to a Clean, Green, and Ethical Supply Chain. I highly recommend the book to anyone who's interested in learning more about the journey your company took to creating a more ethical supply chain. And a really great endorsement for the book, more weighty than my own, um, comes from the founder of Patagonia, where he says, people often ask us, are there companies Patagonia looks up to? We're proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with Dr. Bronner's for the work they've done to pioneer a socially and environmentally responsible supply chain. For the past 15 years, their special ops chief, Gara Lesson, has spearheaded these efforts. His new book is required reading for those who are serious about transforming business to help save our home planet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So everything I've been talking about, he goes into way more depth um, and, and it's an amazing book. 
uh, just about each of our, you know, different supply chains, all the, you know, the local partners, all the ups and downs. I mean, it was, it wasn't easy, but it's, uh, you know, it's a really, really good book. And also he's German American and, um, and really was help really helped us reconnect with our German Jews. So making roots and, and his book is really awesome. Just kind of fascinating talking about his, you know, complex relationship to German history and the whole, you know, trauma and everything they inflict and were inflicted and, and just coming to terms with that and within his own family and country and, um, and then with my family and, and yeah, and it's just really amazing how he weaves it all together. And he went to Amsterdam and got liberated with psychedelics in the same, same way I did. Um, so there's, there's a lot, he, he's, he's very, very honest and, and uh, yeah, it's an amazing book. Highly recommend it. Really great book. Um, yeah. So the next thing I'd love to dive into is, so Dr. Barners has a long history of supporting change by pushing for reform. So as a company, you've leveraged your profits and supply chains to drive social and environmental change. As a family, you've directed over 60 million to philanthropic and activist causes, including 5 million towards ending state and federal prohibition of cannabis, as well as 5 million to the multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies called MAPS. I'd love to dive into a few of these topics. So first, I'd love to talk about the efforts you put towards cannabis reforms. And one of the first things you did at Dr. Bronner's was putting hemp seed oil into your soaps. Can you explain the motivation behind that? Yeah, well, um, yeah, so after college, I went to Amsterdam and in college, I'd um, retired from alcohol culture and, and uh, you know, getting drunk at the bars every weekend and realized like, wow, it's just way better to, you know, smoke some pot and hang out with friends and vibrate in a way higher vibration and listen to music and have amazing conversations. And, you know, by any rational ma measure, it was just way more awesome and less problematic you know and there was a place for alcohol i mean i'm not you know totally, totally against it at all but um but you know it's just ridiculous that cannabis was you know considered a schedule one drug and you know it was a real awakening for me like you know well you know what how, how could we be so wrong and you know and that and you know and it helped me start the, my political awakening about like you know what what else is wrong with this consensus reality that we all live and breathe in um but yeah, going so Amsterdam in '95 was the epicenter of the cannabis movement. Um, it was before '96 when California uh, passed Prop 215, which was the first medical cannabis measure and the first big break in the drug war. But in Amsterdam '95, I was um, I was in a squat. Um, I had a Euro pass, but I was I was just having such a great time in Amsterdam. Um, I was living in a squat. This very international scene of you know, activists and artists, and there were these cats from a church in Arkansas called Our Church that had formed in 93 with cannabis as their sacrament, as a First Amendment religious challenge to the drug war. And that didn't work out, and the feds busted them up, and these guys were facing like 10 years of life. They set foot back in the States, and, you know, a wow. lot of members were in jail. And, you know, and it was like some super sweet vegetarian hippie cats, you know, and I'm, I'm just like, wow, dude, you know, I did, did my country's so off on this and um and it was just such an awakening to the drug war being in, in a sense a, a religious war against the sacrament of my people and that and then this this also was a time that i mean i'd already had some powerful psychedelic experiences but had some really really powerful ones that like really experienced ego death and and, and died in the love and light at the heart of existence and uh realized instantly my granddad was right and you know finally understood what he was talking about which i didn't you know, growing up at all. Um, and uh, yeah, wow, all the faith traditions are pointing at this transcendent, you know, ground of our being and holy quote, you know, you know, somehow in the midst of all the suffering and all the absurdity of life, that's our deepest essence. And, um, and yeah, I mean, there's other paths to get there, but psychedelic sacrament, you know, it's how I got there. And I, I know a lot of friends and family and the amount of healing that they can bring and you know the modern clinical studies now that are showing just the huge benefits to veterans and their trauma and ptsd and end of life anxiety and addictive substance use disorders and you know it's amazing amazing medicine so really woke up to the drug war just being this like you know racist proxy to go after people of color to go after uh you know counterculture activists 
Um, you know, like, you know, basically Nixon criminalized psychedelics and cannabis in 1970, you know, as a way of, you know, arresting and going after what he considered, you know, enemies of the state. And, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's no rational basis for it. These are very safe compounds. You know, no one has ever overdosed on cannabis. It just doesn't happen. Um, you know, no one gets addicted to psychedelics. They're, they're anti-addictive. They actually help people, you know, break addictive patterns. Um, so anyway, so, uh, so I lived in Amsterdam. I actually sold all my stuff. I was going to grow plants, but that didn't work out for various reasons. Came back and was a mental health counselor for a while. And it took me a while. And I read J Jack Hare's Emperor Wears No Clothes in his time. And, and in Amsterdam, I was exposed to hemp as well. So hemp fiber and, and like, did, you know, bags and shirts and whatever. And initially I was like, well, whatever's going to help legalize weed, fine. You know, it wasn't like, didn't put a whole lot of stock in it. But then as I became vegan and, you know, really waking up to the disaster of Western consumption on the planet and, you know, this were wrecking ecosystems and communities and like, we're like a comet hitting the earth and we need to like scale way back and, you know, dietary choice being a huge, huge, thing and actually on regenerative that's you know that we all have a choice like our farm our plates of farm and our forks a pitchfork and our knives a butchering knife like you know what does our farm look like what are we supporting in the world and um and you know the inefficient conversion of, of plant protein and uh carbs and animal protein and carbs, I mean it's a very inefficient conversion process and you know most of U.S. agricultural land is feed crops for animals it's not providing food for people um Anyway, so just, you know, waking up on all these levels and then really starting to appreciate hemp as like, wow, here's this, you know, crop that grows like a weed. You don't need a lot of herbicides and, you know, synthetic fertilizer to grow it, lends itself well to uh, regenerative organic uh, crop rotation. And it's at the nexus, not only of sustainable agriculture, but also drug policy reform as being like the, you know, the worst example of an out of control drug war that's so hysterical that it's scheduling a non-drug agricultural crop as a schedule one substance. And so it was this kind of opportunity. And then it's really high in omega-3, which in kind of soap making terms. Um, so omega-3 is really good for healthy mind and heart function. It's often prescribed in the form of fish supplement. Um, and hemp's one of the few significant plant sources of omega-3, along with flax and there's a couple others. And um, um, so for, for cosmetics and soap making that omega-3 means it's triple double bonds, triple unsaturated, and it makes a really emollient, like really elegant um, skincare and in wash up soaps, it makes the lather much smoother and less drying. So I was able to convince my family just like, hey, we did blind customer surveys, we, you know, super fat with hemp oil, like people like it better, it's just, you know, more smooth and awesome. And then, but it was also at the nexus of drug policy reform and sustainable agriculture and, you know, just kind of our first way of kind of getting and putting hemp, calling out hemp in 99, you know, it was like, almost like saying LSD now. It's like, it was like, which, you know, we did like this, you know, this past year we did our Heal Soul label, which was all about um, psychedelic healing. I thought that was going to be so controversial because we sell them like Walgreens, Walmart and stuff. And, but not, not one peep. I mean, the culture has moved so far that in, and my brother said it right, like we're communicating in a way my mom's church group can receive, you know, just really talking about psychedelics for healing and trauma. But, you know, the culture's moved to the point we're finally getting free of all that hysteria and, you know, whatever um, from, from the 60s. But 99, it was still like really intense and putting hemp, I mean, that was like a, you know, super controversial. And then we, like DEA came after us and got in this big fight with DEA. Um, in 90s so so i mean we, i did think that you know gore was getting elected and canada had just recommercialized hemp and we thought you know it wasn't that long that we would recommercialize hemp but then we got bush and then 9 11 happened and you know the just right wing just went nuts on on all kinds of social issues including cannabis so they shut down all the medical marijuana dispensaries and went after hemp because they don't want us creating like you know, spit cultural space, you know, that contradicting their narrative that cannabis is a plant with root, roots in hell with no redeeming value whatsoever. You know, we're here, well, it actually makes really good soap and great clothes and good medicine. And, you know, they, they didn't want that. So, uh, so we got in this big fight and um, it was my first big activist fight. Um, but we like, you know, basically beat the DEA over the course of three years in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals 
Um, we use the uh, poppy seed bagel analogy to a great benefit that the government was being arbitrary and capricious. And they actually raised the drug test thresholds for opiates because of the tiny trace opiates and poppy seed bagels. And for us on the hemp side, we actually got our production, the GMP, uh, good manufacturing pra practices. And we got the seeds like so clean that the trace minute THC was so minute, it wouldn't trigger at existing drug test thresholds, but it's still they were coming after us, even though, you know, and we, we were able to just show like, this is totally arbitrary and capricious. So we finally won. And yeah, so that was our big, big first like activist, like thing that we did. That's incredible. And I want to call out, so the Honor Thy Label talks about um, this journey as well. And I want to call out something you didn't mention, which was you didn't have to get into the fight you chose to get into the fight because what the DA was going after was um, hemp seed product in food products at the time and your soap product. Um, but you were, you were putting your support and weight towards a cause that was really important to you, even though it wasn't something you had to do to continue producing in the way you wanted to. Um, and I think that's really worth calling out. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it was a little ambiguous how they wrote it, you know, uh, it was like, you know, but um, yeah, because the, the hemp seed oil itself was edible, and you know, you know, so technically before it was soap, it was, you know, controlled and yeah, anyways, it was, but yeah, I mean, we didn't really, we could have probably maneuvered our way out of the fight. But yeah, that wasn't the point. The point was to maneuver ourselves into the fight. So yeah. I love that. Yeah. Now, next, um, I'd love to talk about your support of psychedelic therapy. Uh, myself, like many other people, have benefited immensely from it. Um, it helped me treat PTSD from a fatal bus accident I was in in North Africa when serving in the Peace Corps. Mm. But I had boxed up that experience neatly inside myself for 20 years. Um, but as any unprocessed traumatic experience, it kept surfacing in very unexpected ways until I was able to do psychedelic therapy. And I know countless people who deal with the effects of PTSD on a daily basis. And psychedelic assisted therapy was recently granted breakthrough designation by the FDA for use for treating PTSD and major depressive disorder. So things are moving in the right direction. And I can't wait till a day when anyone who needs it can benefit from it. Now, to name just a few of the ways Dr. Bronner's is supporting this work, in 2020, you donated a million to support the Oregon Psilocybin Therapy Legalization Campaign, which went on to Bass, so a huge thank you for that. You're supporting a decriminalized nature campaign in DC, and there is a Heal Soul campaign communicated on 3 million bottles of your packaging, so sharing information and donating to this cause. I would love to hear more about how this topic came to be one that Dr. Bronner's advocates for. Yeah. So as I was um, saying, I, you know, I've experienced in my own life the just healing power of the of these medicines. Um, you know, my family is no stranger to severe anxiety and depression. Um, if I, you know, I had a cousin commit suicide, and um, oh, sorry. Yeah, and you know, it's a, you know, it's a, yeah, and, the, and there's you know the the current pharma pharmaceutical interventions and therapies are often inadequate for people um and these psychedelic therapies are just showing incredible promise um for as you say for 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 ptsd from process trauma uh, for for refractive grief for end of life anxiety uh not existential dread and just helping people like connect with source energy and realize hey it's going to be all right and you know live out their lives in peace and good quality of life and um uh, you know, people struggling with with alcoholism, smoking, smoking cessation. I mean, there's just incredible um, results being shown with, with psilocybin assisted therapy and MDMA assisted therapy. And then ayahuasca is also, you know, a plant medicine that's uh, a lot of veterans are experiencing huge relief with and people of all walks of life. Um, yeah, so we're you know really passionate about integrating um, our psychedelic allies as soon as possible to help us heal up and, you know, hopefully just be more compassionate, less judgmental people that are more kind to each other and 
um, you know, maybe as we collectively really integrate these medicines, start to be more open and enacting more compassionate, awesome policies at governmental level and better leaders. And yeah, so, so I'm, you know, there's a lot of reasons we're, we're supporting the integration. And yeah, we're leveraging the, you know, our company bottles, you know, like kind of like Thomas Paine style. He was like, my, my granddad was a huge fan of Thomas Paine and pamphleteering and kind of saw what he was doing in that vein. And, you know, using our, our you know, bottles once in a while to advocate for different causes and psychedelic therapy, uh, you know, we've done like minimum wage and, and others. Um, minimum wage was really controversial with our retailers because a lot of them were like the problem. But the psychedelic therapy one was, yeah, it just sailed right on through. It was pretty rad to see. And then Oregon, yeah, we, we, we stepped up and supported Oregon as measure 109 at integrated psilocybin therapy. And then also measure 110 that ended the drug war in favor of a treatment, not incarceration approach. Addiction is not a crime and you're not helping anyone traumatizing them further with, with arrest and, and incarceration. Mm. Um, and, you know, what's getting them the treatment they need and what's better than that than psilocybin therapy. So we like are bringing both of those things together in Oregon and hopefully setting the example for the rest of the country. I love that so much. I honestly think that there's going to be a point in history where we look back at this time where we get not only made psychedelic therapy not accept accessible, but psychedelics were criminalized and we're going to view this time as cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, mm. withholding a substance that can have such a profound impact on people's mental wellness. Uh, I really can't wait for the time when that changes completely. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that's by the end of this decade. If, you know, many, many, a state near you by 22 and 24. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it'll probably be, hopefully it'll be Washington and Colorado in 22, fingers crossed, California and others in 24. And then, you know, MDMA therapy will should be integrating, you know, worldwide in 23, 24, South Cyber therapy, 24, 25. Um, you know, th that's the, that's, I'm, I'm kind of pivoting from state to federal. So the federal approval of those therapies is happening here too. And yeah, it's pretty exciting. Well, thank you for your support there. Yeah. So Dr. Bronner's is well known for soaps. However, uh, this month, August, 2021, you are launching a line of chocolate called all one chocolates. And one thing many people don't know is that the production of chocolates still contains serious issues of exploitation, child labor, and environmental devastation. Can you tell us a little bit about the chocolate and how you decided to launch this new product? Yeah, so as I was saying, our palm farmers in Ghana were intercropping cocoa and, and banana and cassava, and we were helping them you know, with the palm. The palm is, is a key ingredient in our bar soap. and um, uh, kind of gives a, the, the bar's hardness and coconut gives a lather and, and all of its mildness. And, but um, so um, so we were helping to market the cocoa they're producing, which is really high quality to different European chocolatiers. Um, and then the cost of the bananas were being sold on the local market. Um, and, um, you know, and after a while, you know, 10 years, you know, we've been in this and, you know, we're like, you know, man, we should be maybe launching chocolate ourselves and telling the story of dynamic ag forestry, um, you know, basically taking two of the world's most problematic crops, palm and cocoa, and showing how you do this dynamic ag forestry and you actually can do it in a totally regenerative, organic way to the benefit of the people, to the land, the ecosystem. And, um, and as you say, cocoa is like grown in these dense monocultures. It's really insecticide intensive, the, the prices being paid are, are so low that child slavery is rampant. Um, so yeah, so we really wanted to, we thought like, what better way to tell the story of this like method of agriculture that's just so awesome than, than chocolate. And we um, partnered with uh, Joe Winnie. He's the founder of Theo Chocolate. Um, he just happened to have exited a couple years ago for you know various reasons and was looking to help you know rad people and and we know him from building fair organic cocoa supply chains from like back when and uh so he really helped you know bring the chocolate expertise helped you know shortlist potential partners in switzerland 
and we're partnered with some really high level uh, uh, Maestrani. It's a really amazing chocolatier in Switzerland and worked closely with them to make incredible flavors. So yeah, we got like, you know, these hazelnut pralines, almond praline, coconut pralines, and whole hazelnut, whole almond and salted dark chocolate and super delicious. And um, yeah, we're, we're uh, excited to, to launch and, you know, kind of be able to tell this story of dynamic ag forestry with delicious chocolate. And um, yeah, it's a whole new venture for us. That's awesome. I can't wait to try it. Um, and now I know we're running out of time. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you want to share? Um, yeah, no, I think we, I think you covered it. We got, you know, all my primary passion projects. Um, I would say that, you know, my dad, you know, we, we oversaw the donation of what was then one third of our value of, as a family and it was in this thousand acres of land in East County. And we were supposed to sell it to take care of the estate taxes for my granddad um, when he died. And um, my dad, you know, this is like before his death. And he's like, no, you know what? We, we can cover those taxes and we're going to give this to the Boys and Girls Club. And so he and my mom and my uncle uh, oversaw the donation of this land to the Boys and Girls Club. And that really set the example for me and, and my family of like the kind of company we're going to be like, you know, if we don't need it, we're going give it, to give it away. And, uh, you know, and that's, uh, so I just want to give it up there. And actually my dad, that he brought joy to the world with foam. He was just amazing. And um, we have a whole event marketing department now that takes my dad's, uh, you know, firefighting foam, uh, snowmaking compressor foam system. We put my granddad's soap through my dad's compressor foam systems. And we just blast foam all over the world. And it's like an ecstatic experience, like a snow day. I love and that. We have an amazing team that does does awesome stuff. And that's my dad. My brother says, we're soap, you know, make good soap, be quality business, soul, do the awesome right thing, you know, be righteous, but then joy, like make sure you're having fun. And that's kind of like the foam and just uh, we try to have fun when we're, we're doing all this. What an incredible example that your your parents set, that your dad set. Yeah. No, he was, he was amazing. My, my, my dad and my granddad. No. Well, you as well. Um, now taking, stepping into their shoes. Um, yeah. Oh, and I should give it up. My brother, Mike, is company president, Mike Bronner. Um, my brother-in-law, I think I mentioned Michael, is our COO. And my mom's CFO. And, you know, it's not, not just me around here. And I'm, an amazing crew of allies, many of who plugged in from that hemp fight, uh, actually. But, uh, yeah, we just got an amazing management team. So That's incredible. Now, where can listeners find out more about Dr. Bronner's and what you're doing and the causes you're supporting? Yeah, uh, d drbronner.com, drbronner.com, and uh, yeah, associated social media. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. And even Another more so, today. thank you for being such a great leader. Oh, right on. Thank you. Yeah.